friends of mine who, you know, in the in the intelligence space, um, the, the view is, and a view I share, that Putin is absolutely rattled. It's an extraordinary operation, and I think, you know, uh, analysts and tank commanders like me for generations will be discussing this. You know, this this could be more like Stalingrad than like Kursk 1943. We understand they've lost over 4,000 tanks so far. You know, that, that is what they lost in the Battle of Kursk in 1943, which was thought to be, you know, the greatest and the most devastating back tank battle in history. Uh, but... I have just spent about five days in the Sumi region, including a one-day trip to Kursk Oblast in the Russian Federation, which is now occupied by Ukrainian forces, or at least a, a part of it is. And I went with Ukrainian soldiers to Suja, which is the largest population centre that the Ukrainians currently control. Yes, so there's a friend of mine who I can't identify, but um, I was having a cocktail, a Negroni, with him the, uh, the other day, and he said, oh, I've been on holiday, <laughs> yes. Well, so over Negronis, my pal said, well, I've, I've been on holiday. I said, well, I went to Russia. I said, what? Uh, because he's in the Ukrainian Special Forces. And he said, yes, I went there without a passport. And it was only then I got it, he'd been to Kursk. So, and, and um, but what, I said, what was it like? And he said, well, it was cool. And then his sort of, his eyes glittered like that of a wolf. <laughs> but, he, <laughs> but what he said was that the local people were no trouble at all. Welcome to Byline on the front line. I'm Peter Jukes, and I'm here in Odessa in Ukraine. And today, we'll be talking to three people who can tell you exactly what's going on in the front line in Ukraine. First, we'll be talking to John Sweeney in Kyiv about the situation in Kyiv, the capital, and what's happening with the US elections and how important that is to this struggle here. And then to former tank commander Hamish de Breton Gordon, who gives us some more insight into the amazing combined arms maneuver the Ukrainians have managed to achieve in Kursk. And finally, to Tom Much, who's actually been in the Kursk Oblast into Russia, even though technically he was banned by the Russian government. But obviously this time he had some help from the Ukrainian army. Stay tuned and I hope you enjoy the show. Hamish, thanks for joining us. Now, it's a remarkable day today, isn't there? Some major anniversary. Well, absolutely. 23rd of August 1943 was one of the, the greatest victories for the Red Army, the Soviet Army, back in the Second World War. Um, many people will be aware of the great tank battles in Kursk uh, back in 42 and 43. Um, and this is really the culmination of that, that the, the mass of the T-34s from the Red Army uh, crushed the Wehrmacht, who were you know, up till then pretty much unstoppable with their blitzkrieg of tanks across, going west across Europe, and then of course, east into Russia. And I think a lot of people would say this was a key turning point. This was a an absolute dagger through the heart of Hitler, um, absolute um, humiliation for the Wehrmacht, and um, was really, if it wasn't the beginning of the end, it was certainly the end of the beginning. And um, yeah, and how different the Kursk, battle of 2024 is turning out to be. Would you make a comparison? Obviously, uh, this began two weeks ago, seemed like yet another raid. There'd been other raids across the border. Um, in remarkable secrecy, it seems a much more major military operation than just the quick raid across the border to embarrass Putin. Uh, this was an extraordinary operation. And I think, you know, uh, analysts and tank commanders like me for generations will be discussing this. The, the fact that a force of, you know, several thousand people, um, hundreds of vehicles, tanks have been training in secret. And now when I was preparing the first Royal Tank Regiment to do this sort of stuff, um, it took me about a year to train them up to these standards. So um, to do this in secrecy is, is remarkable. Uh, we talk about the transparent battlefield with a drone covering every square centimetre of earth in Ukraine and uh, and on the borders. So how they've done this, where they've done it, is absolutely remarkable. And 
for the first time in this war, we've seen what we call combined arms maneuver. For the first time, we've seen commanders and leaders um, applying the principles of war. And, um, you know, deception and surprise is absolutely key. Attack where your enemy's weak, um, reinforce success. So remarkable. And although this is probably a, you know, a two brigade uh, maneuver, now the Kerr salient, which is, you know, 1500 square kilometers, about the size of the Isle of Wight, you know, it's a sizable chunk of ground. And, um, you know, when I was at Santos, the very first thing I learned almost on day one is when you're in a defensive position and you lose ground, you counterattack immediately. Every soldier knows that. We're now on day 18, I think, yeah. and there is no counterattack. Every minute you leave a counterattack, it becomes more and more difficult. And I think the Russians are going to be, are really going to struggle to retake uh, this bit of ground. And, um, you know, this, this could be more like Stalingrad than like Kursk 1943. Um, so I, a remarkable operation. And it is absolutely, I think, you know, put Ukrainians back on the balls of their feet psychologically and sort of physically as well. Yes, can you explain some of that combined arms doctrine? I mean, we haven't seen much of it during the war. There was a talk last year of a combined arms, sort of NATO-style offensive in Zaporizhia, which was quite quickly stalled. Um, and just explain to the audience what that means in terms of the different elements coming together. And unusually, my understanding is that the way it's worked, like in Iraq or classic NATO doctrine and strategy, that is with air supremacy, or at least superiority. This has been done, well, maybe with drone superiority. So explain some of the innovations you've seen in the last 18 days, Hamish. Well, what we mean by combined arms manoeuvre is, I mean, manoeuvre is, is, is the rapid movement. Um, and it's based around tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, um, artillery, absolutely air power, as you say. Now, the air power is, is usually the fundamental piece of this jigsaw. I think we've all been surprised that Russia has not been able to achieve air superiority, you know, even from day one. Um, it, it's a bit like, you know, the Ukrainians are tre achieving maritime superiority in the Black Sea and they don't even have a navy. So that, that has been remarkable. The key thing with combined arms manoeuvre is really the, the coordination and the synchronisation of all these different assets to create what we call shock action. So you attack very hard in an area and break through, which nobody's been able to do in this war. This war thus far has really resembled, you know, the front line in the First World War, you know, the Flanders fields with trenches and soldiers, you know, a couple of hundred metres apart. Um, just firing stuff and firing lots of artillery and really, you know, gauging how much ground they've got, you know, in in metres rather than kilometres. Uh, and as we've seen with this, you know, we're very much in the kilometre, you know, 30, 40 kilometres into Russia. Um, but when it comes to air superiority, which everybody agrees is fundamental, now how on earth have the Ukrainians managed this? I think that there are a whole host of issues here. Um First of all, it's the Russian fixation on Western kit. Um, you know, the, on day one of the Kursk uh, manoeuvre, the Russians were talking about Challenger 2 tanks roaming all over the place. Um, yeah, I spent thousands of hours in a Challenger 2 tank. Good tank that it is, but it's, you know, if I had the choice of that, a Leopard 2 on Abrams, the Challenger would probably be at the bottom of that pile. It's similar with other bits of kit like Storm Shadow that we'll come on to. But, but on the actual air superiority piece, what the Ukrainians seem to have done is achieve that with, with mass drones. And mm. mass drones, um, you know, just ahead of the main body, uh, providing surveillance and also attack. And that has allowed them to, to achieve the air superiority. And I think also psychologically, you know, you hear whispered and, uh, and, and discussed in the background the great F-16s, which goes back to my fixation about Western kit, that, you know, there are F-16s in the area. And you can almost see the sort of Russian pilots sat in their messes, you know, a couple of hundred yards back from the front line being told, you know, there are F-16s about. And they're all going, well, you know, no way we're getting in the sky sort of thing. And, 
And we haven't, the few Russian jets we've seen over Kursk have been shot down because again, what Ukraine has done is they've embedded air defense in their forward units, which is, um, it's the sort of thing we would do, uh, but it's really difficult to achieve. So, you know, all those, those Russian pilots, not only really, you know, bricking themselves about F-16s, they know if they go into Kursk, they're going to get shot down by, you know, the very latest Western air defense assets. So I think the remarkable in a whole host of ways that this relatively small force has had such an impact, nothing like we've seen before. And I think when we come on to talk about what happens next, again, I, I think, you know, the, the, the Russian public have been fed a diet of Putin's military brilliance, um, you know, are waiting to see what he's going to do. And I think he's going to be once again undone. Yes, when somebody told me they were moving their Patriot uh, anti-missile yeah, batteries and anti-aircraft batteries, uh, making them mobile, which is they're not designed to do. So there's a lot of innovation on the Ukrainian side needs must. Just before we get on to um, quite what Putin's response will be, what the Russian population feel about this, um, just do you want to comment on the idea this was kept secret? From It seems to surprise both NATO and particularly the US and UK. Was that needs must? Was there a sense that there was too much oversight of Ukrainian um, strategy and leaks in that there's allegations that when they did share their battle plans, they would get to the Russians? And there's a sense that the Ukrainians are now going through existential reasons, you know, they are uh, in the front line, that they're seeking... Uh, forgiveness rather than asking permission in advance? Yes, probably all, all of the above. Um, but but I think uh, I think that the, the Ukrainians were, were pretty hacked off last summer when it would appear that their plans are have been were made public and, and of course the, the great summer offensive was was a bit of a damp squib. Um, uh, I am sure also that, you know, we, we, we know that the Russian sort of surveillance machine, the FSB and all the rest of it are all, all over the place, as is the SBU and, you know, Western intelligence agencies as well. And operational security is, is key, uh, you know, so, so difficult to do these days in our, you know, electronic world. Um, so how they so I think a couple of things, you know, how have they managed to do this? I expect with a lot of very clever electronics. Um, when I was a young tank commander in the first Gulf War, um, we in the fourth brigade and the seventh brigade attacked from 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 the east, as it were, or rather from the west, when the Iraqis were led to believe we were coming up from the south of Kuwait. And there was a lot, lot of electronic jiggery poker in those days to suggest that there are a whole bunch of tanks in the south. Now, in those days, that was enough to fool the, the Iraqis. Now, it's, it's much more difficult today, but I'm sure that there has been a lot of electronic activity to confuse you know, Russian surveillance. I'm sure also there's been an awful lot of Western intelligence to support this. So I expect there are a few very closely held, trusted sort of people and organizations, but generally the Ukrainians, um, and, and I know speaking to some of my military colleagues that you, you know, think things are kept on very, very close hold for, for, for all the reasons you said. And, um, and that, that, that has been you know, absolutely successful. And you know, this time the Russians haven't managed to infiltrate it because they have been com caught absolutely completely off guard. So a, a brilliant operation and we'll be all fascinated to know. I mean, my, myself and you know, other analysts and, and journalists, I'm sure like yourself, we're all thinking that actually the Ukrainians were going to do some sort of coup de man type operation into Crimea. Um, you know, I, I was 700 miles in the wrong direction. Uh, and if I was, you know, sure as heck the, the Russians were as well, thank God. But what you're saying, Hamish, is that it would require, given you know, the satellite surveillance, the knowledge of both your know, five eyes, if you like, the US, UK and their allies, there would have been some element in NATO that did know this was coming and turned a blind eye. It wouldn't be a complete surprise given the level of intelligence we have, but maybe kept at a very high level of secrecy. 
Uh, I, I'm sure. Yeah, a absolutely. You know, this is strat two type level uh, intelligence, um, and you know, pro probably probably not, not even shared with political leaders and others. Um, and uh, and I'm sure that you know that those people who knew about it, abs you know, took the view that this was the, the right thing to do. And I I think we, we we all agree that actually you know the best form of defence is attack. And um, you know this, although in you know in theory, um, uh, attacking into Russia is something that Western leaders ha have not wanted to support. But it's the ways and means, and um, you know certainly the way that Zelensky is is describing it is exactly to bring the Russians to the negotiation table on better terms for Ukraine. And in that case, you know he he I think he's achieved his aims far better than he probably could have any other way. Yes, I've heard this concept of the fifth battle space, the information space. You talk about Iraq and the deception tactics there. So what does this do to the Russian information space? I mean, it's obviously a heavily controlled society, dictatorial to a certain extent run by fear, but also by compliance, by, by deception and complicity. Does the, the, this incursion so big, you know, as much land has been gained in two weeks as the Russians have managed to achieve in Donbass in six months. Does this create an information problem for Putin? Does that mean, uh, looks like he's responding with several brigades, that um, this is something he can't control with his own population? Uh, absolutely. I'm talking to friends of mine who, you know, in the, in the intelligence space, um, the, the view is, and a view I share, that Putin is absolutely rattled. And Putin is susceptible to these sort of black swan type events. Uh, a, a, you know, black swan being something that, that is a surprise, um, has a massive impact, but with hindsight probably wasn't a surprise. And I think the two black swan elements to this is, first of all, Putin now has over 200,000 Kursk refugees heading east, really saying, you know, what the heck's going on? Mm. Uh, but also, there seem to be an awful lot of Russian um, uh, locals in Kursk who seem to be pretty happy to see the Ukrainians on the ground. But that, you know, that might be a, a, a you know, bit of bit of disinformation and propaganda. And the second black swan element to this is we understand that um, an awful lot of very raw recruits have been thrown into this meat grinder. You know, these are young kids, you know, eighteen years old, being given two days training, and really are. Are more of a hindrance than a use. Um, you know, that's when we discuss the combined arms training that Ukraine's done. It takes months and months and months. Um, if you give a young kid a rifle, show him how to shoot it, um, they are, are little more than, than cannon fodder. And that's what seems to have happened. And I think this whole conscript thing and, you know, the possible mobilization that's been talked about is causing Putin a lot of problems. You know, even, even the propagandists who populate the TV shows in Moscow every night are beginning to question what's going on, you know, what's failed. You know, the great Russian bear is, you know, has taken a hell of a pasting here in Kursk. And that is beginning to resound around. And, you know, Putin is getting to a stage where he can't just throw, you know, ethnic Russians into this um, you know, some of the some of his rich and wealthy and well positioned mates, their kids are about to be called up, and you know the you know the the, the white Russians, as it were. You know, they don't. Most of them like to sit in their dachas in St. Petersburg and Moscow and not get involved in the mucky business of of fighting. But it, it's coming to their doorstep, and I think all of this is building up, which is why Putin, for the first time in two and a half years of this war. You know, he's on thin ice and it's getting hotter in Moscow every day. Well, as we saw in Afghanistan, the mothers of these conscripts, uh, if they're white Russians, they begin to have a say, the families who suffer bereavement or injury or capture, as many have been captured. So this sounds like it's, it is, a, in terms of in that information space, quite a strategic move by Ukraine. What 
and we're only speculating here, and I'm sitting in Odessa and tomorrow's Independence Day and there's likely, obviously, to be some uh, reminders from Putin of his strength. What do you think uh, Putin's options for retaliation, punishment are? Because, I mean, the amazing thing is if you told me, I'm sure you, two years ago, that the Ukraine would invite, it would take a huge a sizable chunk the size of Isle of Wight of Russian territory, that would be a red line. And we'd be discussing nuclear options. Those don't seem, they seem, those red lines seem to retreat. But what options does Putin have? Well, I mean, this is the fascinating piece. Let, let's take the, the sort of strategic bit to start with and, and the red lines and the escalation. Um, you know, I, I've been writing almost since day one of this war that Putin's nuclear threats are irrelevant, bluff and bluster. Um, you know, every red line uh, has completely withered in the wind. You know, in the Kursk operation in the last 18 days, if you look at Russian nuclear doctrine, Putin two or three times could have pressed the button and sent a tactical nuclear weapon into, you know, into Ukraine. Um, you know, he hasn't done. And despite the fact that, you know, some of his attack dogs like Medyev and Peskov have been shouting about this. It's, you know, I, I hope that those leaders in, you know, London and Washington and Paris realise that that is the case because they have used this escalation to keep back Western weaponry. And in my view, that's why we've seen the drip feed, the drip feed of tanks, the drip feed of artillery, the drip feed of long range missiles. And the fact that we have now that, you know, the crucial Storm Shadow missile, which is absolutely required um, to thwart any counterattack, you know, is still being discussed. And, you know, Zelensky last weekend had to, you know, call out the new Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, and say, you know, why, why aren't you bending your back anymore? What's mm. what, what's going on? Why why can't we use Storm Shadow? And I, I you know, he pointedly said, you know, when you're at war, there are no summer holidays, suggesting that the new cabinet is on summer holiday. And the fact that we haven't heard from the defence minister or the prime minister over the last week, Zelensky probably has a point there. Um, so I think when it, when it comes to, to escalation, that's, that is not going to happen. When it comes to, you know, what could they practically do? I, I go back to one of my early points, you know, you, you counterattack in the, the minutes after you've lost ground not days and weeks, you know, again, we, we talked, this was so successful because the element of surprise. Now, we we seen some relocation of Russian forces and there's talk, as you suggested, a couple of divisions moving uh, into space. Well, you know, if, if it's been talked about on social media, you are sure as hell that um, those exact coordinates are, are known, you know, in, in Kiev. And uh, which is why I say again, storm shadow is so important. And I'm sure that there is a balance that, um, although Putin, he, he, you know, a typical tyrant, just like Hitler, he's using what we call a long screwdriver. So he is trying to make tactical decisions, you know, military decisions at the lowest levels and directing his generals what to do. You know, first of all, he's not a military guy, he's a spy. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, having crossed both worlds, they're very, very different. And, um, you know, a very good spy is not necessarily a very good general uh, and, and, you know, vice versa as well. So, um, you know, it is it is almost one, one is predicting he's going to make the same mistakes as Hitler and uh, not get involved. You know, Winston Churchill did this as well, but... You know, Winston Churchill was a pretty decent soldier and knew what he was doing. And most of Churchill's military decisions were very sound. Um, and, you know, Hitler uh, and, and was not and, and, and Putin's looking that way. So, you know, it, I think it's going to be incredibly difficult. What we're also seeing Ukraine do is what we call preparing the battlefield. Right. So they've dropped three major bridges. Um uh, you know, any any counterattack into Kursk has got to get across that river. And each time the Russians try and put a pontoon bridge on or anything else, it's 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 hammered. And, you know, I, I know from personal experience going through the breach in the first Gulf War, going through breaches um, in Iraq and Afghanistan, 
this is when you're most vulnerable. Right. So, you know, almost if the Russians are setting up to put two divisions across that river, you know, they could be absolutely hammered um, because it takes time. You know, there, there is no surprise. You mm. know, everybody's looking at it. Every satellite, every bit of electronic warfare is covering those potential crossings. So, uh, you know, I, th I think the... I personally, looking at it from my tank commander's, you know, hatch, can't, cannot see how the Russians are going to effectively retake this, except in an attritional format. Um, and in that case, and again, you know, it's the defense is always much easier than attack, unless you've got the surprise that the Ukrainians showed in Kursk. So I, I, whether Putin's listening to any of his generals, who knows? Um, I think, you know, th again, this is why, you know, I, I think Putin is it's rattled, isn't it? Dif difficult position um, because, you know, he could be just about to, you know, slaughter his last decent um, uh, manoeuvre brigades and, and soldiers uh, in some, you know, devastating attempt to get across a river, which um, he's going to be flattened with high Mars. And actually, if if we allowed them to use Storm Shadow, um, they wouldn't even get anywhere near the bridge near the river anyway. So you spoke there as with a great insight of a tank commander. Just pulling out finally, sort of looking at the whole battle space. We have um, Makinmova, I think, into a big air base, two hundred and fifty kilometers away from the front line, which is used by Russian jets to. Um, to deliver munitions to Ukraine. You have an attack on the last ferry into Crimea. You have Rostov on Don, all the oil, uh, a huge oil installation still burning like five days onward. If you were just panning back as a more strategic view, what do you predict in this uh, months ahead? Just briefly, I mean, we, obviously it's dangerous to predict, but the rains will start in October. Uh, combined arms, I imagine, will be more difficult, though amphibious assaults or parachute assaults, I suppose, could happen in sort of cloudier weather. What do you see happening? Basically, Kursk as a so exchange for the Donbass, where we are in World War I situation, where the Russians are gaining ground through a massive artillery attack and mobile arms in Kursk. What do you see the winter um, ahead looking like? Well, I think it's, it's what we see, what we what we hope and what will actually happen, which, you know, not necessarily the same thing. I, ideally, they would be. I think Putin, again, by his poor decision making, has brought a lot of this on him. The Ukrainians were very canny back in March. They, they flew a drone over his palace in Moscow and it went on to attack a, an oil refinery. But they took a picture of his his palace and put it on the internet, which then made um, Putin withdraw air defence from the front line to, to protect his palace. He's withdrawn other air defence to protect his palaces in Sochi. Um, and the line coming up is out that, you know, key key high value targets are protected by air defence, but not but not soldiers on the front line. I mean, that sends a hell of a message to your your, your fighting men predominantly on the front line that um, you know, much better protect um, you know, the gold and silver in Putin's palaces than, than you know, the young men of Russia on the front line. So um, they, they are weakening. And you know, when they've, we understand they've lost over 4,000 tanks so far. You know, that, that is what they lost in the Battle of Kursk in 1943, which was thought to be you know, the greatest and the most devastating back tank battle in history. But they, they've already surpassed that. Uh, and whatever people, you know, although they might, the economy might be on a war footing, you just can't generate that sort of peace, which is why, you know, some observers, you know, saying, well, we need to be careful. Whoever replaces Putin might be worse. He, he might well be, but he's got no army to threaten the West for, you know, a decade or so. Um, but, yeah, I, I think we're all hoping that there's going to be a bit of quid pro quo here. And, you know, I've, I've just been tweeting about the, the anniversary of the, end of the last Battle of Kursk in 1943, that, you know, th this is the time to exchange captured territory, you know, get back to uh, 2014 uh, borders, you know, maybe maybe not the Crimea, um, but uh, that that would hopefully satisfy people. But, but let, you know, let's not forget, you know, six, 
Apart from the 4,000 tanks, we understand over 600,000 Russian soldiers have died. You know, that, that is a lot of mums and dads, uh, and most of them probably don't know it yet. Um, and, you know, in Afghanistan, I think the, the Russians lost about 20,000 or less soldiers. So this is on a, you know, completely different scale. And of course, you know, they, they, sh they should know about it, the mums and dads, and they'll learn. So um, I think there's also a possibility that Ukraine might actually, you know, do another lightning strike elsewhere. Um, it's, uh, again, it's rumoured. So that, that might be part of the deception plan anyway. But, you know, as, as the Russians sort of super tanker, as you were, lurches towards um, Kursk, it offers opportunities elsewhere. And again, which is, you know, one hopes that the Western leaders are, are onto this because, you know, the situation has changed. And, you know, in, in military planning, you know, we, we always ask ourselves four questions. And the fourth question is, has the situation changed? And if it has, that's when you have opportunities and you need to adapt your plans. And lots of people are saying to me, well, you know, we're not, we can't use Storm Shadow or other missiles because of escalation and all the rest of it. My view is, no, no, the situation's changed. There are real opportunities here. This is where we need, you know, real leaders to step up to the mark and absolutely, you know, back Ukraine to the hilt. Give them all they need. You know, again, it's, it, it's no point having tanks set in, sat in tank sheds behind me on Salisbury Plain. Um, you know, in 10 years' time when the Russian army might be built again, you know, we need to have a, you know, a different sort of tank sort of thing. There's, so there's no good at keeping stuff in the shed for tomorrow we need to grasp today's opportunities. So, and I think if we do, then you know, I'm relatively hopeful that uh, you know, even Putin or whoever replaces him will, will, will want peace because I, I, I can only see lots of Russian death and destruction in Kursk, undoubtedly, sadly, also Ukrainian soldiers. And, um, you know, if... Putin is as smart as he tells us. He, he will now look for a way out, which doesn't involve, you know, hundreds of thousands of his own people being slaughtered on the front lines um, in in Kursk and the Donbass and Crimea. Hamish, thanks for your practical military insights and your historical comparisons. Uh, we'll keep, be keeping a watch on this position. Obviously, a lot potentially happening in the next few months, and I hope you'll join us again. But thanks. Meanwhile, for your great insights. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Good morning, John. Where exactly are you? I'm in Kiev within stone's throw of um, St. Sophia Cathedral because I like to book uh, Airbnbs um, within eye shot of, um, of the big cathedral here because I think that Putin um, wouldn't send his rockets um, to hit a, or to risk hitting a cathedral. Now, the problem is the accuracy of Russian rockets can be a bit iffy. So that anyway, that's my strategy. Um, some of the time, and I'm you're assuming that. a sort of rationality <laughs> on the part of Putin. Um, last night, Kamala Harris gave her speech at the Democratic National Convention, uh, confirming her candidacy as their nominee for president. What did you make of her speech, especially about NATO and Ukraine? Yes, yeah, so the, 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 um, the line was in the, in the foreign policy stuff. And, and to be honest, uh, as a, a great supporter of Ukraine, the convention had been pretty disappointing up till then because so much of the focus was about domestic um, American politics. I, I can understand the reasons why. But it was depressing that there was very, very little on foreign affairs and in particular on Ukraine. And then um, at the, in the last gasp, first of all, you had Adam Kitzinger, um, who is a Republican, a former congressman who actually turned up at the, for the Democrats and said, listen, I don't agree with you guys on lots of stuff. But about democracy and about Ukraine, I do agree with you. And then that led on to Kamala and Kamala said, I stand strong with Ukraine and our NATO allies. And the significance of this is this is the most important speech that Kamala will probably make before the election. Um, mm -hmm. And in front of all, you know, the thousands and thousands of, a, frankly, almost idolatrous supporters, but she's making a big commitment 
to standing strong with Ukraine. And so I think a lot of people here will have um, heaved a sigh of relief. It was also um, politically, I thought, a very a very well-made speech. It wasn't very long and it didn't overdo. It was more like the speech of a commander in chief, far more so than what Trump's been doing. And it showed a sober side of her or more sober side. And also that she so it hit the basis on I was, a, you know, I'm a, I was a prosecutor. Trump's a felon. All that stuff. So it was, it was statesmanlike. I thought, or stateswomanlike. Um, but it certainly delivered on the foreign policy stuff, and that, that is the great anxiety. The great anxiety here is what happens if Trump wins. And by the way, that's good. That's exactly what I was going to ask you. Um, so in a way, it's you've been out of Ukraine for a few months and back. Obviously, we'll talk later about other things happening on the front. But the huge strategic issue for them, isn't it, is U.S. support. And you, you're one of the few, I always mention this, the only person I know who's doorstepped Trump and Putin. Um, it is a historic first, as far as I'm concerned, um, that had Trump, should Trump win the election, the Ukrainians and NATO in general, the Ukrainians would be very worried. And so that must have caused a lot of anxiety when he was ahead in the polls and Biden was still in the race. Yeah, I mean, there was um, there were two great anxieties back then. And it, it, it's only a month ago, if that. Um, <laughs> but there was a time when the Ukrainians were doing very, very poorly militarily. They were, they were essentially what, what Russia does is create a meat grinder and it feeds its own people into it. And the problem is that Putin doesn't care about his own people. And the Ukrainians do. And they, they've suffered a lot of losses. And one way of looking at the war right now is that Ukraine is slowly, very slowly, bleeding to death. So this, the war, as Russia is running it, can't go on. Then what's happened is this exciting um, kind of special military operation by the Ukrainians into Kursk, which we'll talk about, but but that has changed the game. And the second thing is Biden standing down. Now, I'm, I still remain worried the um, the betting market uh, briefly put Kamala ahead, and now it's, um, or rather um, yesterday, it put Trump ahead again, in part, I think, because the Democratic Convention, although beautifully done and was... I think it, it, it banged too many of the Democrat drums. And actually just um, last night, having um, hearing um, uh, the, Repu- the former Republican congressman and Kamala be really quite... The message was, was moderate and from the centre, and that's how you win in politics. So I think I'd be interested to see which way the betting market goes. But even if Trump wins... I think the Ukrainians will still, um, they're not out, they will, uh, you know, life will be much, much t- tougher, and they will have to concede a, um, um, a lot more ground. But they're not going to, um, they're not going to fold, they're not going to buckle. In, in a, I mean, I'm, you've got to look at it like this, I think, Peter, is that I don't think either side, the Russians or the Ukrainians, are ever going to get complete military victory in this war. Mm. Um, and, by, and that is Russia's failure because they started it, they invaded, they invaded Ukraine and they haven't been able to crush Ukraine far from it. Right now, you know, David has just attacked Goliath. Amazing, but true. Um, so so then the question is, which society, which which country will... will will fall apart first under the extreme pressures of, of near total war. And, and and I would put my money on Russia falling apart first because, because of, a, of the enormous strains and the problem is that Putin's war is, it's, um, there's, there's evidence that he's running out of, um, of ready cash. So, for example, the Financial Times has been reporting that the Chinese have lowered the amount of money, and it wasn't very high anyway, to, um, for Russian oil and gas. And that has led to a reduction in the price of, of uh, global oil prices in, in Brent crude. And then the other day, Putin goes to Azerbaijan. 
And the speculation here is the reason he went to Azerbaijan is to say to the Azerbaijanis, can we put some of our Russian oil and gas through your pipelines so you can sell it as Azeri uh, oil and gas and, and um, we'll give you, a, you know, whatever it is, 10, 20, 30 percent. So that Putin is worried about the stresses of war. He has now this humiliation of the Kursk invasion. And he's in more trouble than Ukraine, which as a society is exhausted but defiant. The way I would describe, um, and I've, as you say, I've been away since I um, tore my knee tendon seven months ago, but the way I describe Ukraine is not a state of um, defiance, exhaustion. It's the other way around. It's exhausted defiance. And the defiance is a critical thing. That's so I think even if Trump wins, Ukraine is still fighting. That's, uh, you know, first time here for 10 years. I was last here 10 years ago on Independence Day after the Maidan. Um, you know Russia fairly well, and we see this incursion into Kursk and the attitude of civilians, because what's clear here, and having gone to Kherson front line, is everybody is activated. The sort of volunteer sense the Ukrainian people is very extensive. They make their own drones, they clean up the mess, they volunteer. What you see in Kursk is not the same, is it? We have a society which is kind of very um, withdrawn, doesn't trust authority, doesn't seem to be engaging any kind of uh, sabotage or insurrection against the invading Ukrainians. In fact, videos of them welcoming Ukrainians. Is that what you're saying? In a way, the strength of the two societies, one's much more brittle, shallow, uh, dictatorial, and Ukraine, is, to my amazement, is so much based on sort of a democratic sense of volunteering. Yes. So uh, there's a friend of mine who I can't identify, but um, I was having a cocktail, a Negroni, with him the uh, the other day. Outstrong. And he said, oh, I've, I've been on holiday. <laughs> yes. Well, so over Negronis, my pal said, well, I've, I've been on holiday. I said, well, I went to Russia. I said, what? <laughs> uh, because he's in the Ukrainian Special Forces. And he said, yes, I went there without a passport. And it was only then I got it. He'd been to Kursk. Right. So, and, and um, but what, I said, what was it like? And he said, well, it was cool. And then his sort of, his eyes glittered like that of a wolf. <laughs> but, he, <laughs> but what he said was that the local people were no trouble at all. Right were no trouble at all. What they did was they... Um, so when Russia invaded Ukraine, the big war, February 22, there were there were tractor drivers who, 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 who could kind of block roads to, to help stop the tanks. People threw rocks at them. Tractor drivers stole tanks. They, they um, The whole of Ukrainian society... And, and by the way, this is in the east, and this is the um, a lot of the, the Russian-speaking areas of Ukraine, which Putin thought would just come over to them with flowers and and uh, and presents and stuff. None of that happened. So the whole, and by the way, if you invaded any part of the United Kingdom, even Clacton, <laughs> the locals would go, excuse me, Rusky, on your bike. Yeah. You know, long before the British Army turned up, people would be throwing fish and chip wrappers and uh, empty coaches and everything. <laughs> Um, well, I don't know about I don't know about what he would do. I thought it would be throwing uh, the barrage at the tanks. It would be, I'm sorry, it would be wrong to conjecture. <laughs> uh, but okay. but um, but what's amazing and astonishing is when Ukraine invaded a bit of Russia, Kursk, mm. that the locals don't give a tuppenny damn about Vladimir Putin and his regime. Amazing. And by the way, this isn't the first time this has happened. It's the second time that, that there has been an invasion from Ukraine. Because last summer, Yevgeny Prigozhin and his Wagner army in the mutiny, they they went from um, Ukraine where they've been fighting in Bakhmut, and they crossed over to Russia in Rostov and Don. And nobody in Rostov and Don, none of the civilians nor the coppers, stopped them. So this has now happened twice. And what that tells you, and that these are kind of like, these are the only reliable opinion polls that we've got. And if you take our, if you unplug the brainwashing, if you unplug the, um, the Kremlin lie factory, the, and you look at the behavior of ordinary Russians, they don't care about Vladimir Putin and his regime, because the regime and Vladimir Putin doesn't care about them.
And, 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 and I think the whole world can see that. Now, what's strange and difficult militarily for the Ukrainians is that they were hoping that the, the Russian invasion would lead to um, the Russian army pulling people out of the east, and in particular, the front of Pokrovsk. And, and the Russians are making kind of serious advantages, uh, advances now. And the problem is the Ukrainians don't have enough artillery and enough stuff to fight strongly on both fronts. But it looks as though they've made a, a calculated decision. It's better to press ahead with a special military operation, special military operation, in, in Kursk because it makes the big point that this massive country, with all the world's biggest country, with all its oil and gas, with all its resources, and it's you know it's got something a population of one hundred and forty million, well, hundred more roughly than Ukraine, it can't beat them. Not only that, but Ukraine is invading a bit of Russia. It's humiliating for the Kremlin, and and I think it causes trouble for him. So they can't defend their own borders. Well, it's. It's now, it was in February 2002, I remember you posted your first war diary and the orange hat became an iconic significance and Vladimir Putin, do F off, became a buzzword. <laughs> Did you imagine back then in Fab February 2022 that you're heading forward to post your 1,000th day diary? Uh, no, um, no, I didn't. But l later in 22, um, and when we made our film um, for Byline TV um, in February, Under Deadly Skies, um, which is available on Amazon Prime and all good places, um, we talked to a lot of Ukrainian soldiers who said, no, this is going to be a long war. This is going to be a long war. And they, and um, the way they said it, I thought, no, that they're, they're more right than wrong. There is, I mean, I, I am excited for Ukraine that Kamala has nailed her colours to the mast. That's good. That's a positive. I'm worried that one of my friends said, the problem is, if you're Ukrainian, this feels like gladiators. And what's happening is that the Americans who've got the big clout but, and the West generally, what we're doing is we're keeping the... Ukrainians in the fight, but we're only drip feeding them supplies. We're not really giving them enough to defeat Russia. And the, there is a very um, plain reason for that is that the Americans are afraid of Ukrainian victory leads to Russian chaos, leads to the fall of Putin. And then a rogue Chechen will get hold of a nuclear weapon. And then China might take uh, Siberia and become effectively the richest and biggest and most powerful nation on earth overnight. Mm. Now, these American nightmares are, I think, misplaced. What they're really afraid of is an Iraq 2.0 happening in Russia. Right. But the problem is that with that is that if they don't stand up to Putin and let the Ukrainians fight, uh, fight our war um, for us, then Putin stays in power. And, and we also know that, I mean, Putin helped get Trump into um, the White House in 2016. I believe that he also helped um, the Brexit vote cross the line. And he is a continuing danger to everybody in the Western world or who believes in democracy and the rule of law. So we should stop mucking around and seriously help Ukraine. John, as always, wisdom in an orange hat uh <laughs> vast years of experience <laughs> <laughs> wisdom shining it's, hot. <laughs> it's getting hot um <laughs> thank you for all your updates we'll speak to you again very soon love to kiev and thanks for joining us cheers old boy uh so tom where are you now and where have you just been i am back in kiev However, I have just spent about five days in the Sumi region, including a one-day trip to Kursk Oblast in the Russian Federation, which is now occupied by Ukrainian forces, or at least a, a part of it is. And I went with Ukrainian soldiers to Suja, which is the largest population centre that the Ukrainians currently control. 
Um, look, you know, that's quite brave a thing for you to do because as a New Zealand citizen, I think you are banned from going to the Russian Federation if it was in control of Russian forces. What was your what, what was the atmosphere like there? Do the Ukrainians seem in control? How the Russian population um, reacting to the uh, control of their territory by Ukrainian forces? Yeah. So a lot, most of most people in the affected region have evacuated. They've evacuated to the main city of Kursk, but we did get access to a humanitarian shelter where there were probably about 25 to 30 civilians sheltering. They ranged in ages from from a young kid who looked like he was about 10 all the way to uh, obviously pretty elderly people in their 70s and 80s. They looked like they had a lot of amenities and that they had, you know, they were as well taken care of as they could be in a situation like that. But obviously they were terribly frightened and they had... Uh, you know, they, were, they certainly weren't enjoying the situation, I'll put it that way. Um, at some point, you know, there's been a few teams of journalists in and out, and they're sort of getting a bit sick of, of, of being asked because journalists will come and they'll be like, what do you think of the war? What do you think of Putin? What do you think of this and that? And they'll, they'll always give you, I find, I find Russians often do this, they'll always give you this sort of pat response about, oh, Politics is a dirty game. It's nothing to do with us. You know, we're just simple people and we can't affect it. You know, the, the, those who are in charge are going to stay in charge and nothing we can do will ever make it, it will, will, will ever make a difference, which is a mentality that is very, very different to the one that you come across in Ukraine, where civic participation, protest, fighting for sort of democratic rights and, and freedoms is, is really baked into the culture here. That's a very astute observation. Now, you've been all over Ukraine, amazing access to the front lines uh, in Donbass. You've been down to Kherson. I'm just wondering what you, the level of destruction is compared to, you know, Ukrainian towns and villages subject to Russian occupation. Was there a distinct difference in the sort of targeting of military versus civilians? Did you feel the Ukrainians were conducting a very different kind of occupation than you'd seen from the Russians? So it's worth pointing out that this was lighter than I expected in terms of, you know, how hot the situation was. It was like, you know, Bakhmut or Kherson are quite a lot more intense. This was, you know, we could definitely hear artillery. We could hear shelling. There was a, at one point we had to, we ended up having to stay in the basement with the civilians for about an hour, more than an hour because they saw an Orlan drone. And they were like, we don't think it's safe for us to leave just there yet. But I didn't, we didn't have any situations that really felt scary. Now, the Ukrainians were able to push out the garrison of this town uh, pretty quickly. So, yeah, there are, there are a reasonable number of destroyed buildings, but it's hardly like this is like Bakhmut, a city that's just been absolutely leveled to the ground. Now, we understand that the Russians aren't really using and bringing their, uh, their artillery to bear on the city to try and kick out Ukrainian forces yet. They're still trying to sort of stabilize the front lines to the, uh, to the east of Suja and to the west near Koronevo. And I think it's Pushkovko, that pocket where, where there are quite a lot of Russian troops stuck against the river. But, yeah, that said, this was done in a sort of a breakthrough, breakout operation. So you don't, you, don't, you don't know how much destruction would have been there if the Ukrainians had had to fight for it street by street like the Russians have had to do for every town in Donbass. Well, what do you think Ukraine is going to do next in Kursk? Is it going to advance? Is it going to dig in? And I'm sure you've followed reports that there's quite a large number of divisions, two divisions and several brigades are being sent in that direction by Russia. Obviously, it's an embarrassment that they can't retake it. What's your feeling of the intention of Ukrainian forces? What's going to happen there in the next few weeks? Oh, I don't get the feeling that the Ukrainians are going to necessarily be able to advance that much further, right? They may have, it seems they're taking a bit of an operational pause and they want to try and take, there'll be the town of Koronevo, which is to the west of Suja. You know, the Ukrainians will probably try and try and capture that within the next uh, week or so. Then, as I said, there's the pocket of Russian troops. They're probably going to want to try and deal with that because one of the things they're trying to do here is they've managed to capture large numbers of, of prisoners of war and conscripts. Now, those are really important because the Ukrainian, there are still thousands of Ukrainian prisoners in captivity, a lot of whom were taken from Mariupol when the city surrendered. So the Ukrainians really want this kind of 
POW fund, as they call it, to <laughs> to be able to swap for their soldiers. Now, I, I, there's also a big political element to Kursk as well. It's a real black eye for Putin. It makes him look pretty weak and uh, pretty, uh, you know, unable to protect the security of his own country. And it shows that the Russians probably didn't have, you know, large numbers of strategic reserves because it shows that they were all, you know, they're all basically committed everything to the Donbass. Now, that doesn't mean things in the Donbass are not, you know, quite quite rough at the moment for Ukraine, but it does show you that the Ukrainians are still pretty capable of, you know, throwing, you know, r rolling the dice and throwing a kind of a spanner into the works of Putin's war machine. So just going back to your first coverage of the war over two years ago, did you ever at that point think you'd be stepping foot inside Russia? Uh, I mean, I had always thought to myself, OK, this is probably the end of my... I, I had once taken a short um, vacation uh, while I was travelling in Russia. Uh, that had only been about 10 days. And I remember when I got into Ukraine, I was like, well, this is probably it. I'm probably never going to be able to get into, uh, into Russia again. Then, two months ago, I was officially banned and but from the Russian Federation. The, the, the embassy in New Zealand released a statement saying... Uh, these are a list of journalists who, because of their helping foment a Russophobic campaign, are banned from ever entering the Russian Federation again. Six, seven, what, seven weeks later, I was in the territory of the Russian Federation again. It sort of reminded me a little bit of like when they said her son will be together with Russia forever. That lasted about two months. and <laughs> That was about the same time as my visa ban lasted. Well, well done for breaking that ban somewhat unexpectedly. And just finally, uh, Tom, where are you going next? What's your plans for your next bit of coverage in Ukraine? So the the I'm I'm taking a short holiday, but the the major focus at the moment after Kursk that people are looking to is the Donbass town of Pokrovsk, where it seems that. Uh, Russian forces are making fairly steady advances. Now, it remains to be seen whether they will have, you know, any chances of actually taking the town quickly or whether the Ukrainians will try and hold and defend it like Bakhmut. Uh, but that is definitely the sort of area of interest outside, you know, um, for people watching from outside Ukraine, that that's worth keeping an eye on at the moment. Well, Nick, great reporting. One of the first Western journalists to get into Russian territory through the Cursed Salient and also having breaking that ban. Look after yourself, take a quick break and keep safe. Thank you very much for having me.